that's uh, that's fantastic, Paul. Thank you very much. I mean, if, uh, you know, as someone who's been heavily involved in other excavations which you've used photogrammetry, I do know talking to colleagues who've, you know, um, it's is again we have some points that were made by the seven partnership in reality in relation to their um, their their three D modelling at, uh, at castle sites. You know, the repeat visit. So when they've left the site, when it's all closed down, the ability to return again and again and again in three D to your trenches or to your building is is hugely impactful and important, you know, and actually helps with that iterative interpretation process we were talking about at the at the outset. Um, thank you, I sort of took a bit of prerogative there to, uh, you know, <laughs> make a bit of a comment, but I'd like to thank all of our speakers because I think it's been a very, um, you know, interesting, informative and, it, dare I say, it, eclectic mix, but I think that's how it should be because I think this forum is very much about bringing together practitioners um, bringing together colleagues in local authority, um, you know, and covering many different aspects from the regulatory through to the, you know, um, bright wide light of new technology. And I think that's really, you know, it's been really, you know, insightful bit about today's session. Um, I'm all I'm going to do really is open the floor up to questions. There's no structure um, to to how I want this to proceed, but we have sort of scheduled in, you know, 15 minutes or so to have a quick discussion if everybody's you know up for that um so i very much open the floor out to um anyone who might like to contribute including our speakers if they've more they want to say about their talks or um points they've noted from other people's talks as, as we've gone along they would be greatly appreciated so adam's got his hand up so adam can i um throw open to you hi uh, thanks, everyone. That's really been fantastic. It's very good to see some different stuff going on. And um, I particularly wanted to ask Iris if that's all right. I put it in the notes about um, how your um, AI would work with the same kind of data set, but derived from uh, drones. And so a digital elevation model from um, UAS photogrammetry. Do you think that would work on, on how big a sort of size data set do you need? Um, yeah, I think it it could work. Um, so one of the things I think that with, with the drone survey, you can get much more detailed than what we are using with the one meter resolution. So you would be able to look at different things. So now we're looking at very large earthworks. But I think that if you train something on the, um, on the drone footage, you might be able to, um, uh, yeah, to get those um, graves, for example, like that would be really important to detect something like that. So I do think that like it depends on uh, how unique the pattern is. So for example, for um, a desert of medical villages, we, we didn't need that many examples to be really good at training them because it only took maybe like 30 examples because the, the combination of objects that are within it are so unique in the landscape that it's, it was able to find that. But for example, with mounds, um, with finding burial mounds, we did find a lot of false positives, for example, on like um, uh, roundabouts and things like that. So there we really need a lot more examples um, to make sure that the pattern is acceptable. So something like the graves, um, and um, will it work with multi-spectral photogrammetry as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it'll so that... add more accuracy. Because I think that generally what we see is that if, if we manually can see the pattern and we can see more with more with different types of data, like the, that, that really helps the AI as well. That sounds fantastic because go, trawling through all the multispectral outputs to try and come up with an interpretation is quite laborious. And so what you've done, it sounds ideal for what we're trying to achieve. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I can sort of reiterate that point as a as an HR officer. Often we're we're dealing with you know huge, as you say, the the growth in data is is, is problematic. So I do think that AI represents part of the of the future. Um, you know, um, I, I I think you know. It's and it's really interesting to hear you say it can combine different data sets because I think that that really is the key here. You know, as we set out at the outset, you know, that the lots of the projects we talked about today wouldn't have worked if someone had collected one particular data set. It it just wouldn't have, uh, have been viable. You know, so I think this is this is where the real strength lies. Um, so um, thanks, thanks Adam, thanks Iris for those. Um, uh, any any more for any more? Any anybody got any any further points? Hi Giles, yeah I've got a question and you alluded to it at the start and then I guess as you've spoken in the different talks everyone's spoken about kind of the amount of data that people now have. Um, 
what are the recommendations or is, or is there kind of good practice guides in terms of how you store the data? I guess, what, what data do you keep? Where, where do you store it? How do you store it? I think there's there's several answers to that question and I'll obviously let other people, you know, jump in. But from my perspective, I think um, uh, you've got the sort of usable data, you've got how it's used um, and how it needs to be used. And we've had some great examples there of, you know, different um, users using the same data in different ways. So the building managers, you know, having their CADs, you know, um, you know, lots of building 3D data and, and BIM kind of, you know, um, meshed in together um, through to people who are looking at these things interpretively. And we've had great examples of that, you know, with Sketchfab as an output with Matterport, you know, they are putting stuff out there in a very accessible way, you know, that and I know that, you know, speaking to the Earthworks surveyor at, at Pulverbatch, you know, he took Adam's photogrammetric model and um, uh, sorry, at cause. Sorry, no, I was the surveyor at Paul Verbatch, but he took, uh, but cause he took the earthwork model with alongside his analytical earthwork survey and was able to cross compare, you know, um, and so having that usable was a, a major part of that data deposition from that model. But then we also move into the territory of digital archive, and it's one where probably, you know, I have greatest interest um, in some respects because, you know, I, I've been involved in many projects where we've looked to reuse data and that can be problematic for some early data acquisitions for particularly things like LIDAR. Um, so it's about, um, and there are emerging digital standards, but, um, and, and, I, and I believe Historic England are doing quite a lot of work on digital archiving at the moment about, you know, large scale digital data sets. The issue becomes in maintaining that digital data set, you know, and we're often caught in the middle as a digital deposit, you know, comes into the into the historic environment record that actually we're not a date, you know, what we're not an accredited digital archive, and that actually there are requirements to to maintain access to that. It's not a it's not a cost free, you know, process, um, and we do need to be mindful of that. But I think you know, I think that's emerging. Um, I think there's been some really good work on getting agreements on formats, you know, that are usable by um, many different non-proprietary softwares, you know, so it is getting more open source and we are able to kind of, you know, um, sort of think about, you know, the the, the life of these, this data after the projects are finished, you know, is becoming a really good concern, you know, across, across the industry and across local authority. That's enough from me on that topic. Is there any thoughts on digital archiving from, you know, any of our participants out there or anyone else? Well, I have to say, actually, I mean, we've um, been asked to archive our data and of course it's, it can involve huge amounts of photographs and the uh, the photogrammetry processing um, outputs and things like that and that's a huge amount of data you know gigabytes for per project and um, uh, and that can get quite costly if we're able to put it up onto the ADS and things like that mm. um, but ultimately we keep absolutely everything so we have multiple storage facilities um, with enough space to keep everything from from when we started basically 15 years ago and um, but the outputs that we generate, particularly when we're producing interpretive reports, are just PDFs. So that that initial sort of view into that data set is just a PDF and that doesn't take up very much space at all. And um, and so we're sort of kind of archiving those uh, where, we, where we're asked to do that. Um, and then the raw data um, and the really big sized outputs that we've generated, we're storing for now until at some point those we can uh, more cost effectively store them elsewhere. Fantastic. Is there any um, sort of comment from the seven partnership? Because I imagine these um, big, you know, laser scans, yeah, you know, yeah, and particularly yeah, the accuracy yeah. you were talking about in Scotland, you know, this is, is, is just going to exponentially increase the amount of storage that's required. I mean, have you run into issues with archiving those with, with like Historic Environment Scotland or anything? Hi Giles, yes, um, all of the projects we work on really, um, the, the mobile mapping data in particular, um, we've got a working server here that's currently 120 terabytes um, and that is full almost all of the time. Um, our average projects are probably between two and three terabytes per project 
and we have to keep duplicates of those as well. Um, so we collect in, like um, Adam is, vast amounts of imagery along with the point cloud information um, and the infrastructure projects that we're working on can be um, 30, 40, 50 miles in length of motorway or highways. So it's it's easily accessing that information, storing it. Um, we're looking more at cloud-based storage, but obviously it's the time it takes to get the data from the server in the office up onto the cloud and, and vice versa if you want to get it back for a client later on. So this is why we're sort of investing so much time and money into ways of displaying this information to the clients in an easy way. Um, there are a lot of um, web viewers now that are, that are getting released um, and there's a lot of development going on in web viewers. So it's, it's basically a HTML link that, that exports out and everything, the imagery, um, the point cloud and everything else is embedded in that HTML link. So it is getting there, um, but we aren't able to share um, the raw data or the actual process project data with clients unless it's on a uh, we transfer link or on a on a solid state drive that gets sent in the post. Um, so we are we are facing huge challenges here. Uh, yeah. All of the historic environment stuff goes on a hard drive, um, but then the readily available information we'll do some fly through so they can see what the data looks like. If they want us to interrogate in any more detail, then we can. They do have a digital documentation team, uh, Historic Environment Scotland, and they have got the ability to view the data um, if they want to. But for us, it's the storage um, and the working working ability, because a lot of these projects have to be processed locally on the PCs. So you have to have sort of PCs with two or three terabyte storage internally um to be able to process it so yeah it's it's a challenge for all of us i think but yeah it, it's something we're slowly trying to overcome absolutely i know i i I, th I think there's i think we all have to have in the back of our minds how it's being used i think we got comments from paul i think came in first so are you um are you able to 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 join yeah. Paul? yeah yeah uh, it's actually hi iris can i ask you a question please yes and uh, i just want to uh, picking up what james said um giles said earlier about the um the aerial photographic archive in Shropshire goes back to the 1930s. Uh, I wanted to, to ask you whether you had been looking at historic photographs, uh, aerial photographs, you know, and can you can you combine, you know, layer them, stack them, say a 1940s black and white photograph with a 1990s colour with a 2020 hyperspectral? Yeah, I think that, that should definitely be possible. Um, so what we would have to have is like a G being georeferenced so that we can we can use the data. So we found that like Historic Environment Scotland has a really good uh, data set of, of, of their georeferenced data. And um, so like there is so much data as well, like in the archives of uh, even like um, Historic England that is that is uh, not georeferenced. So those data sets are would, would require too much effort for us to 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 use. But like. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously like lots of those uh, images have a lot of value for us and for the archaeological record because they might not, uh, they might have a different land use now that doesn't show the archaeology anymore and crop changes, have, crop practices have changed as well to precision agriculture where we might not even be seeding them in uh, in, in um, crop markets in the future. So yeah, there's a lot of potential value in it also with using maybe some of the old um, uh, Corona satellite images and right. and such uh, data sources. Yeah, we really would like to be able to use them. But so far we are going for like the, the low hanging fruit of, of easily accessible data sets, but eventually cool. really want to be using them as well. Cool, thank you. Thanks very much. I, um, I think Adam, you came in next, please, if that's all right. No, I didn't. My hand is still up. Probably. Oh, sorry. Ap apologies, my uh, my my poor chairmanship. Um, uh, Morn, are you um, are you got a point to make? No, just a question, really. Um, Morn Kappa from the University of Chester. I work with Giles on on the Shrewsbury Castle project. Um, one of the things I've been wondering from a from a practitioner heritage management point of view is how realistic our scoping is for these kind of the financial needs and the kind of digital data sets we might be asked to produce these days. It sounds like in terms of the several projects we've mentioned, um, you know, digital has been a big part of those. I wonder if, if anyone could say a little bit more about that. 
I, I think I think yeah I I think to, just to point out yeah there, there there is you know obviously a big financial burden to these things and and you know when you're doing these in a in a development management context um you know there are increasing arguments to make about you know digital preservation but it's you know the proportionality argument is one we have to continuously back you know back up ourselves um and we would obviously argue that the the digital archive is a fundamental part of of any project um but exactly it's quite hard for us to scope because the technical expertise doesn't lie with us often about how just how big these data sets will be and i think that you know i think that's why we we really need to work closely with practitioners you know in developing briefs for these projects which um have digital archiving at their front and ensures that there is funding you know secured and in place for that and i think you know i think there's a lot of lessons to be learned of, of some big you know projects which n haven't necessarily considered that from the start um i won't say much more than that um but is there any comment from any of our speakers who've been involved in you know trying to get these digital projects archived and funded from our point of view on the private sector not that we've tried to get anything funded but we're normally bidding for the projects and as darren said we've invested a lot of money in technology and um, data collection there there is, there is a, an expense to it and from a private point of view, you know, we need to get return on on the investment on the equipment. The, I think the key thing to get across to the client is <clears throat> that um, we have the same survey once used many times, and that's what you get with a digital data set. Um, the other thing is it saves from health and safety point of view, it's less boots on site. I know somewhere like Nescliffe is uh, a nice place to go when you want to get out there. But um, a lot of sites, again, <clears throat> you can um, call it up on your PC and it reduces um, on-site costs in itself anyway. And the data can be used many times. Um, as Darren mentioned before, our data goes to multi-discipline design teams, um, 12 or so different categories of different engineers. And I think uh, that's where the value is. You could also add to it and the the detail and the specification um, sometimes it'll say a but in actual fact the the data set has collected b c and d which can be used at a later date so it's all about educating the people as to the value um, the costs are what they are but overall in kind of my career the uh, the it costs have, have dropped incredibly really over the last 20 years and that's what's helped um, bring on this kind of data set. Thanks Mark, that's really helpful. Um, can I ask a follow-up question um, Giles because I kind of uh, would love to. Um, I was really interested to hear about Iris's project which I've heard about a couple of times now. Um, I didn't know Iris if you've got any urban potentials for the kind of work you've been doing. Have you considered whether you could use it in the urban historic environment in the same sorts of way with the correct kind of training? Um, we've we've uh, found a lot of rich furrow in urban areas in like the um, the parks and such, and um, so there it, like we can use it. But um, generally, uh, yeah, if we can't see it with the human eye, um, then it's really difficult to train the AI to, to see something like that because we don't know what to train on or what to look for. Um, there is the historic mapping. We we are looking a little bit at digitizing. Uh, rapidly digitizing historic mapping and so that's that's the potential but um yeah so that's the answer <laughs> wonderful thank you no i mean historic mapping would be certainly you know something would be um great to start looking at you know for um for various projects we've got which are kind of thematically ranged you know um as someone who's sat there and identified you know all historic farmsteads in shropshire you know from uh, second edition on the survey mapping I would uh, be grateful for some help from a computer in that regard um, it certainly probably gets less bored at lunch times as you said than, than I do um, so um, but actually conversely lots of my crop mark spotting is done at lunch times you know in my in my spare time so but interestingly you know lots about the morphology you know stuff you were talking about the computer recognizing is very much how the human eye recognizes patterns in particularly in crop marks you know um, so yeah, fascinating stuff.
if are there any more questions uh, or comments uh, across the floor at all any one of our participants um no i think we're I think we're good in in which case i'll start to draw things to a close just by saying thank you so much to our range of participants i think it's been fascinating to kind of hear from you know private sector public sector um uh, and the academic discourse as well all in one room which i you know i, I think is a real um plus point of groups like like this one um and uh and what we will be doing um i as i understand it um pascal correct me if i'm wrong is sharing the recording um with 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 the wider group um and we'll make that available so there will be an opportunity to review stuff um and i'm sure that some of our participants will be happy to share their their um their their um email addresses um so that we can keep in in contact because it's really useful to have a network like this of people who are working on various aspects not only related to the historic environment, but related to geospatial data more generally. Um, I know I found this a very productive group for that. So um, I'll probably draw it to a close on that note if there's no more comments. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your forbearance um, uh, with my timekeeping. And uh, thanks to all, all of our speakers um, particularly, but thanks to all of, our, um, our, 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 all of you for, for being here with us. Um, and on that note, draw it to a close. So, Thank you very much for your attention and uh, and uh, hope to see you again soon in a, in another session like this. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Charles and everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.